Welcome everybody to Learn With Lowell. Today we're rejoined with Kelsey Moody. He's the CEO of i Life Sciences. He was on here five years ago. He's rejoining us. Uh, just like a couple highlights. Uh, they're doing the Aubrey Gray Mice study. Uh, they've been in the longevity space for over a decade. There's a lot of stuff that we're going to get into today, but uh, uh, just jumping in. Uh, uh, Moody, welcome to the show. Welcome back. Appreciate you having me again. Sweet. So one thing I've noted in a lot of your talks, you start by saying more or less that you're an evil capitalist and like you're here to make money, which is pretty good because sometimes people are just very idealistic in terms of like, you know, the pie in the sky. But at the end of the day, if it can't make money, you can't really do anything with what you're developing. So I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, I, I tried guesstimating how, like what your monthly burn would be for all the stuff you're doing. And I can't figure out how you are still in business after five years and not in a mean way. I like this is my, my question is, how have you managed to keep like the profit centers working, the IP generating with the different arms, the investment, the new uh, clinical studies, like you do, you do like so much. And so like, I, I've been wondering, like, how do you not have like 150, like $500,000 of a burn rate, which is completely unsustainable? Well, well we do, but it is sustainable. Um, yeah. So kind, kind of the business model that we we took with i um, you know, we, we need to be able to run full drug discovery programs from, you know, ideation into and eventually through clinical trials. Um, so when we built the organization, um, we have, you know, tons of capabilities and stuff, and we can sell that as a service. Um, so we're actually a profitable contract research organization. We service about 100 different pharmaceutical and biotech companies running preclinical R&D. At any point in this conversation, if you find value in it, please subscribe. It is hugely beneficial, and it tells Google and everyone out there that this is content worth watching. Thank you for everyone thus far who has commented, liked, subscribed, and told their friends. And then we take the profits from those activities and spare capacity because you're never running at 100 percent. And we use that to support our own intramural programs, some of which are more uh, discovery academic types of projects. Others are more mature stage that we spin out as companies. Um, so, you know, having a mix of, you know, venture capital for our portfolio companies and then um, profitable revenue streams from just basic contract work um, allows us to sustain the organization and have all the tools at our disposal to you know go after these very diverse projects that we take on why don't more people do what you're doing because the i've had a bunch of other biotechnology you know science people and their 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 budgets are basically you know down to the right you know money's going out ip should come soon <laughs> type situations but if you can be profitable like what you're doing you can keep doing all the things you're doing like it's such a great thing so wh why do you think more people aren't copying your model in the longevity space building out these type of like like, I don't know, like almost like a platform of services. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's not easy. You know, it took us, uh, you know, it took us something like three, four years of, you know, kind of focused effort on the contract work in order to get to a point um, where it's, you know, pretty comfortably uh, sustainable. Um, and th there's also startup costs, right? So, you know, if you're taking a, a kind of traditional, you know, private equity backed um, contract services, business plan um the investors you get for that and the cash outlays and how you build the business is completely different than if you're doing um you know a, a traditional drug discovery company whether it's an aging or, or anywhere else um you know we happen to have investors that appreciated our focus on both but usually and that's because they're philosophically aligned investors um but usually it's one or the other private equity people that would do a service sector uh, uh, organization, they're going to be worried about the bottom line and what's the profitability. And they're going to be looking at that, you know, uh, you know, 25 to 40 percent, you know, profitability and putting in cash to do strategic acquisitions for um, non-organic growth and things like that. That's completely different than someone that's trying to build drugs and is completely different than a hybrid model, which is what we're developing. So I think just most investors wouldn't have the appetite for supporting uh, what our investors were willing to support. Mm -hmm. Well, just on the uh, tangenting into the investor question to get people that are aligned, that's a big problem that people have finding the, because everyone wants to say yes, or like they'll slow know you, you know, like they, like very rarely can you get people to like, you know, uh, it's a little bit of an art to know if someone's like bullshitting you or not. So uh, I'm just wondering, how did you find the investors that were philosophically aligned with what you're trying to do if it, it, it was it as simple as just telling them your plan and then watching to see if they gave a shit like i i'm, I'm very curious about that 
Yeah, I, I mean, we've got a lot of investors that we've worked with across our whole portfolio. So different stories for each. Um, but I, I think kind of the take home is, um, you know, when you go and like watch Shark Tank or whatever, there's this idea that you can go convince someone to invest in this brilliant idea that you have. Um, I've never convinced an investor to give us a dollar. I've only ever found people that already wanted to deploy cash on the things I was doing. So it, it's less about presenting some brilliant plan and convincing someone to get behind it and more about I'm doing this thing. Are you interested in engaging to do this thing also or not? And in some respects, that's just a numbers game of, you know, talking to enough different people. Um, what's cool kind of about our organization is we're involved in so many different projects. We get to, uh, you know, facilitate deals and interactions, even if they're unrelated to us, because, you know, we might have startups that we're working with that are looking for capital from angels that we know and things like that. So there's, you know, we, we get to see a lot of stuff. But um, yeah, in terms of my own fundraising, I, I'd say that was part of it is just finding the people that were already interested in that. Um, the other piece, at least when I first started, you know, I was all in and I told them that it's like, you know, I was in medical school, uh, definitely tracking for, you know, a nice lucrative job as a clinician. And, you know, it was like, okay, I'm going to drop out of medical school with $100,000 in debt to work for $36,000 on a therapeutics company. Um, that's probably the definition of insane. And, you know, they asked me, they're like, how do you know it's going to work? And I'm like, well, I don't, but I think it's, you know, it, it's worth my time to attempt. And, you know, this is the skin that I have in the game. And they were, you know, very receptive to that and, you know, kind of knew that we'd have the grit and dedication needed to make it successful because we had so much skin in the game. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like it's one part, just not sales. I think sometimes people view pitching kind of like that Carl salesman, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, the, the, the pinstripes are, 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 you know, classic or whatever. Like they're always trying to like, uh, you know, push something on you. It sounds like more like you're you listen and then align their interests with yours in terms of what you're building. So that's one part in terms of the skills of me just trying to just deconstruct what you just said to me. It sounds like it's listening and just saying very clearly what you're trying to do, and then at the same time demonstrating your level of commitment. Uh, you know, thirty thousand, hundred thousand dollars in debt, like you're all in that type of stuff. People love that. Um, in terms of like deconstruction, like what was it that let the investors know that you were the right person? And at the same time, I imagine. If they were receptive to it, like you're saying, you weren't convincing them of it. They were more like almost like talking themselves into the deal. They were looking at you and they were seeing the things that they wanted. They were looking at you and hearing the things that they wanted to invest in. So they knew that you were the person that they wanted to like put the money in versus someone else. Yeah, I I I think so. I mean, you'd have to ask uh, ask yeah. our investors, you know, why they decided to take a gamble on me, and I appreciate that they did. Um, but as far as I can tell, you know that that's kind of where I think their heads were at. Did um, did it, was that something that you knew right away to do, or was that something that you learned over the course of many pitches to do? Just the authentic, you know, saying what you're trying to do, tell them exactly how committed you are, um, type of thing. Is it like an innate quality that you brought into the to, to the field, or something you developed over the course of pitching? Five, you know, I don't know many people. That, that's just how I engage with people generally. Like, you know, the, the the problem with the life sciences and aging and all these different things is it's it's very, very complicated. No one knows everything. And yet when you go through, you know, a medical doctorate or if you go through a PhD, um, you know, there, there, there's this kind of idea that you have to be the expert and you have to be infallible and you can't be wrong and you can't not know things. And I've always just kind of been rather clueless. So I engage in that way. I ask a lot of questions. I'm very transparent about what I know, what I don't know, and what I think I don't know. Um, and, you know, th there are people that can present very, you know, th that are very smooth and can do, you know, the used car salesman thing really well. I'm just not that polished. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, when we engage with everybody, it's, you know, we try to be as genuine as possible. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes that's a bad thing, but we're at least consistent with it. Um, and that's just how I engage with the world. Same thing with, you know, I, I don't engage with investors any different than prospective collaborators, than prospective employees. You know, you, you engage with everyone with the same level of, you know, transparency, genuineness, and bluntness. And I, I think that's how you, you know, kind of get to the the meaning in relationships regardless of where the relationship comes from 
Yeah, I was gonna. That was you. Kind of guessed at my next question, which is, I bet this framework is something you apply everywhere. It's not like a, a one-off. Like when you're in, uh, interviewing people, you know, Bill Gates has this thing where it's like um, he hires people that would be doing the thing anyway. So when you bring it, when you're looking for partners or looking for people to bring on the team, it's probably you're looking for people that have uh, demonstrated a willingness to do that work anyway. And so you're just really bringing them in and then like giving them money to to do it uh, with you. Yeah, a hundred percent. And honestly, you know, most of my job these days is just cutting red tape and making sure that there's no arbitrary barriers that, you know, prevent our scientists and our team from doing the things that they're great at. And, you know, if you're surrounding yourself with really high quality people and you're eliminating as much of the bureaucracy as possible, it really creates a, you know, environment for, you know, for them to be successful. Um, and frankly, for me, you know, one of the big attributes I look for um, is I like hiring people that are natural teachers because what I've been able to do over time, you know, I never got training in, you know, biophysics and structural biology, for example, but that's a huge part of our business model, a huge skill set for drug development. And, you know, I, I identify as a bit of a structural biology and biophysicist hobbyist now just because of the number of those people that I've been surrounded with and how much you've been able to, uh, you know, to learn over time just by seeing data and talking to people. It, it creates a very enriching environment. Mm -hmm. The so this was the question I was going to ask you later, but it's just a nice segue now. The, uh, what was, because we're, we're sitting for, I don't know when this is going to go up, but we're sitting at uh, the tail end of November for 2023. And so I'm wondering, what, uh, what did you learn this year? What did your team teach you this year? Oh, man. Um, I, I think the biggest thing, and this has kind of been on the back burner for a while, and we've done work with it, but um, I've really been brought up to speed this year. Um, and that's a, a phenomenon called liquid-liquid uh, phase separation. Um, if you'll bear with me for, for mm -hmm. just a moment, I'll, I'll try to break this down for, for the audience, because I think this is going to be a hugely important thing for aging and drug discovery broadly on a move forward basis. Um, and, and we literally, like last week, gave our first public talk on phase separation at the Sinotherapeutics Conference at the Buck in, uh, in Nevada. So this is something we're just starting to talk about. Um, but when you look at how most drugs work, um, they'll disrupt, you know, you have two proteins that come together and your drug will disrupt them, or your drug will bind a protein of interest, think, you know, a receptor that you're labeling or something like that. Um, and so these protein-protein interactions are how most people think about how proteins and therefore how drugs work. Um, there's another biological process that I, I won't bore your audience with the technical details of now, um, but basically uh, within cells, um, your cells are able to create these kind of, uh, they're called biomolecular condensates. Uh, they're, they're kind of like a gel. You could think of it like a gel um, with it, or maybe like a droplet of oil within water uh, in terms of uh, visualizing it, though the physics of how they work is different. Um, but this is the process for how proteins create very, very dynamic complexes and can come together to form work in specific areas of the cell, and then they reverse and the condensates disappear. And, and when you look at a lot of the senescence targets. So we we see a lot of like stress granules form and things like that. They're very characteristic of senescent cells. Um, those are all phase separated condensates that have gone a little bit too far in their processing. They, they, they kind of overshot where they wanted to be within the cell. And when we look at a lot of the attractive drug targets for aging at the protein level, different transcription factors, stress response genes, the mechanism of action for most of these proteins is through phase separation. And this is a thing that almost no one in the aging space is talking about. Most people don't even know this is a thing. Um, and even with our pharmaceutical partners, um, the more sophisticated pharma companies understand this is a thing and take it into account when they're you know, doing drug screening and target validation. Um, but uh, only the most sophisticated groups that we're talking to are, are aware of this. And we've actually seen about a dozen programs in the aging space specifically either fail or be significantly delayed because the companies thought they were developing a drug for a normal protein-protein interaction, and it actually does phase separation. So um, probably a little bit 
too in the weeds for 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 your audience for this podcast but um you know this is an area we, we've put out about five papers in the last 18 months or so on um starting to build the tools so that we can uh study and drug phase separation in a very intentional way to have you know desirable physiological outcomes and i think you know 10 years from now 15 years from now um all of the drug targets that next gen drugs are going to be targeting at least as far as small molecule are concerned are going to be proteins that phase separate not you know receptors because we've been able to drug receptors very effectively for decades now yeah no and definitely not two in the weeds this is a um this reminds me of something I was, uh, this is going to be a, a thing I was going to ask you later because I was watching an interview and actually I, I was re listening to it when I, uh, we were having technical difficulties. It's called The Diary of the CEO, the, the podcast uh, group, and they were interviewing Brian Johnson. And at one point in time, uh, Brian Johnson says that, uh, this says this thing I've never thought about before, but it's kind of like alludes to what you're saying, which is that like people don't realize that they're living in the past. You have to actually look to the future to think about what's amazing and what you're doing today. Because uh, even uh, Daniel Ruiz, or Ruiz who was on the show says that, you know, it takes about 20 years for something to go from academia to uh, even being used on something. So now is actually 20 years ago and stuff like that. So I'm very excited for the cutting edge. That sounds like something very interesting. So I'm, I'm just imagining like, how would you, how would you apply face separation into a therapy or a drug? I'm, I'm picturing MRNA where you just kind of load something up and does something else. But um, so yeah, how would you use this technology to do like any intervention? What would it actually look yeah, like? Yeah. So, so, so the, the idea is that, um, if, if you develop a small molecule for a traditional protein-protein interaction, right, you want your molecule to stop two proteins from touching, and that has a desirable effect, or you might want your molecule to bind a receptor and that either inhibits it or activates it, depending on what you want. And that's the, the mechanism of action for how your drug works. Uh, with phase separation, the, 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 physics of how that works and how the proteins interact with each other uh, is active, it's dynamic, it's not a static direct interaction in the same way that normal protein-protein interactions are. So knowing that that's a thing, uh, if you're trying to make drugs that modulate proteins involved in phase separation, the tools that you use to screen those drugs are different. The tools that you use to study what effects your drug is having are different. When you get into the, the mouse model, you put the drug in and there's a clinical outcome or not. Same thing if it's a protein-protein interaction. But for iterating your drug, if you have a small molecule and you're trying to modify it to become more potent and have all these you know drug-like properties if you have the, the 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 biophysical mechanism of how that drug is working wrong then how can you iterate it to make precision drugs mm -hmm. that do what you think they're doing um and 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 so i think the utility of you know uh, of understanding what phase separation is, is next gen small molecules are going to target phase separation. Um, we can kind of overcome some of our ignorance about phase separation now by, you know, gene therapies where you overexpress proteins that are involved in that. Um, you know, you can, you can modulate phase separation in that way by knocking out or overexpressing proteins. Um, but that's kind of a very, um, you know, hitting something with a hammer rather than precision medicine approach to, to, to modulating these things. Yeah. And if I'm understanding it right, it sounds like it, that, you know, uh, hit or miss approach is more similar to the protein, uh, protein one where it sounds like it's like a light switch, either you're on or off to zero or one, knowing whether it's uh, modulated or like decreased. And if, uh, if I'm understanding the phase, it's more like a dial. You can like really dial in um, yes. Once again, I'm just thinking of lights where like you can dial. No, yeah, no, that, 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 that's a, that's, that's an excellent analogy. You know, normal, normal drug, you're either lights on or lights off. Whereas, uh, with phase separation, it's a spectrum from, mm -hmm. you know, soluble protein floating around to this gel like thing, and it can exist anywhere in between. So if you want to modulate it, you're, you're, you know, trying to build a dimmer switch. That's a, a great analogy. Yeah. I, I can see the, I can see the immediate benefit of the difference of those two approaches in in the iterative approach what you're saying because the i imagine how much time it would take if all i have are, is poking a hole in something and seeing what comes through 
you know, like turn something on, turn something on. Like how many lights, how many times do I have to light switch something to find what I'm actually trying to, to do? Like all the different controls to, to do that versus the DAO where you can just slowly incrementally move it up and down. And um, I feel like be, like in terms of a series, it'd be much more easier to, to, to focus in on what the problem is or focus in on what's working right or even um, find, you know, uh, uh, like black swan events where like something's going weird here and you can kind of like isolate it down when you're developing it. I think uh, it's like when, when I have a bug in my uh, code and I'm, I'm coding something, um, a lot of times I put like, you know, uh, console logs everywhere, but I do them in a very specific way so I can kind of see like how uh, the chain is propagating. And it sounds like um, the, the phase mechanisms would make it really easy for you to see what hidden features are in um, in any study that you're working on. Yeah, I, I, I think that yeah, that's probably a, a pretty a pretty good summary. And anyway, yeah. so we're we're we put out a bunch of papers on you know building tools and stuff around this. We're probably going to be launching some purpose built portfolio companies in the near future around it. But um, in terms of you know things in the aging space that we're excited about, phase separations probably number one or maybe tied for number one with uh, you know Aubrey de Grey's thousand mouse uh, lifespan study because that's. Uh, we, we, we've seen like a, a huge increase in the number of lifespan studies. Uh, we, we do a lot of those, you know, on the contract basis. And then also uh, we're aware of lots of other groups running lifespan studies. And there's been a lot of just promising data coming out, super encouraging uh, on that front. So those are kind of the two areas that I'm most excited about personally. Uh, the Is there any downside for the face separation? Uh, is it, does it cost more? Like, is there any like weird hidden oddness that would make it some, uh, like a path people won't want to go down? Uh, it's it's harder. So like, mm -hmm. if I if I have, you know, if I have a protein interaction, I want to make a drug for, you know, I have protein A and B, they come together, and I want to make a drug that disrupts them. Um, my path is to make protein A, make protein B, develop a lab assay where I can see if those proteins are interacting, um, and then quantify, you know, dope in different molecules and see how well the molecules break up the interaction. Then there's a lot of downstream iterative stuff that you can do to make the molecules better. Um, with phase separation, a lot of times these are protein complexes that uh, are in, you know, involving, you know, not just one or two, but, you know, five, 10 more proteins all at once. The ratios of each of those proteins and how they form the complex uh, matters. And um, the proteins themselves tend to be um, more difficult to manufacture for screening purposes. And when you can manufacture them, uh, they're harder to get large scale uh, at scale and harder to get um, high purity. So drugging proteins that are that are involved in phase separation are just inherently a lot more difficult. Um, and there's not as many tools in the toolbox. Um, so, so, so the downside is that they're harder. Um, mm -hmm. For context, you know, we're aware of uh, a, a couple of companies. I think probably the main one right now is uh, Dewpoint Therapeutics. You know, they've raised like $300 million, all preclinical, and they just have like a microfluidics platform for screening phase separation reactions that they partner with Big Pharma. So just the fact that they have anything that they can try to drug these things at all Um warranted $300 million in, in venture backing. Um, so these are very complicated um, molecular targets for which we don't have good tools to study right now. But that also means that there's a lot of opportunity for people that recognize this as a thing and are prepared to, you know, build the, build the space out, so to speak. Yeah. It sounds like, a, uh, you know, it's like when something's hard, it, it's, is it, is it just because it's new and you know it hasn't been like proven out which means that the people who can get ahead of that curve and kind of own that space will have a, a huge opportunity in fielding all those uh, contracts and stuff like that the, are you um which leads me to my my two questions uh which are branching i'll, I'll let you decide which ones to go down first <laughs> is uh like how has phase separation impacted your current portfolio companies is there anything about that knowledge that you've used to incorporate um, in a, a portfolio company in some way. Um, if you can't be specific without like being IP, I, that'd be great. But if not, I understand. Then the other one is like, is there a desire that is being manifest with money and effort to uh, develop these tools and analytics and all these uh, phase separation type technology in-house right now with what 
with, yeah, once again, with yeah. all the stuff that you're already currently doing, there's a lot already on the plate. <laughs> yes, I'd say a, a major, you know, we, we have uh, teams dedicated right now to building out the tools necessary to mm -hmm. um, study and drug phase separation reactions. So that's a major focus. And, um, you know, I would expect, you know, ho hopefully within the next 12 to 18 months or so to be launching um, at least one portfolio, new portfolio company focused on that. Like I said, we've got about five papers or so, uh, peer reviewed papers in the last 18 months that we've put out on, on this topic. And we've got probably another half dozen or so in various stages of peer review at the moment. Um, so that, that's definitely an active area of interest. And um, it, it is helpful for all of our internal programs, both, both for our programs as well as our client programs, because a lot of people don't know phase separation is even a thing. So when they come in and they think their drug is working through this, you know, a, a traditional mechanism and it's not, um, we can identify that pretty quickly and tell them that. And so that saves a ton of money and allows clients to avoid running down, you know, dead rabbit holes. Um, and same thing for us. And, you know, that that's part of why we're so interested in the space as we, you know, started looking more and more at different aging targets that we could, you know, develop drugs against, we realized so many of them phase separate. So if we want to build, you know, I, I think kind of our, our first generation of bona fide, you know, longevity therapeutics are going to be repurposed drugs, maybe some gene therapies and reprogramming technologies mixed in there. Um, but I think your your second generation, uh, certainly small molecules are all going to be molecules that, that target phase separation reactions. Um, and just by seeing these aging targets and realizing that's a thing really led us to, you know, prioritize this uh, internally at our company. Yeah, the um... What you're doing sounds very similar to the framework that a lot of investors, uh, like when they're when you're pitching them, sometimes it's not just you know the value in terms of what, aligning with their vision. It's also how can this new thing that you're developing fit within their portfolio. So it sounds like a lot. I always wonder like why do people do what they do? But if I ask you like why you did something, like sometimes people don't have the best answer. So I don't. I try to like squirrel around it before I ask. But uh, the, uh, if I were to ask you like why are you doing this, it, it, it sounds like why are you doing this versus something else is it benefits. Uh, your your whole stack like it integrates so uh uh powerfully in everything that you're doing versus like you know anything else out there there could be some other compelling things that you could be doing with your time but why this versus that is that it, everything can incorporate in and it can be multiplicative um it'd be my guess is why you're choosing this over potentially anything else that's exciting yeah and and you know when, when you're in the business of tool building you know like at the end of the day, there's going to be, you know, there's all kinds of wonderful academics across the world that are studying, you know, their favorite pathways and proteins of interest and really sorting a lot of the biology of aging and, and you know, the biology of disease. Um, but if you don't have the tools to take those discoveries and turn them into products that can help people, um, then they're, you know, very cool science projects, but, you know, you're, you're really not delivering on, you know, the promise of, you know, the future of medicine. And so, you know, our, our kind of approach, it, it's the same reason why I got into drug development in, instead of just finishing, you know, medical school and being a physician is, you know, a, as a doctor, my positive influence um, is linear with proportion to the amount of hours I work, right? Like if I work more hours, I can see more patients and I can linearly improve the lives of more people. But if I develop a drug for a disease that millions of people have, and I can get that successfully to market in a way that's safe and efficacious, then um, I can have a uh, you know, very nonlinear impact on patients' lives and the human condition. And that was my motivation for going into drug development. And why we're building these sorts of tools is similar logic. Like you said, mm -hmm. we can you know, benefit the whole stack, not just for us. I could fail at every single thing that I'm doing, but if we can put some new tools online that can advance how drug discovery and development works, then there's tons of companies that can benefit from that and you can still have a, a tremendous net positive effect. It sounds like if I were to guess, uh, if you're successful in everything you're doing, you have the financing for everything you're doing, that eventually you'll have like almost like a Bell Labs of innovation going on or like a VIS type organization where you have like all these different departments, all these like really smart people doing stuff. Is that the ult ultimate vision that you have for um, i -Corps? or um, or is it an alternative vision? You want to stay like a small giant? 
No, I, I, I think that's very much the vision. And, you know, that's what we've been building for the last 10 years, you know, mm-hmm. manually, organically, brick by brick is, uh, you know, building out facilities, bringing in technologies and, you know, and people and, you know, building these little innovation clusters within the company. And, you know, I think that's very much in line with, you know, with our culture and how we approach science broadly. Yeah. Is there anything missing from, so you have the whole view. I mean, I I couldn't say everything unless I looked at like your books or whatever. But um, which I want, I like nonprofits coming on the show now because I can look at all the tax returns. Which you, you I I did not know it would be so much fun. Uh, there was there was a uh, I had a nonprofit come on and they were so surprised that I had so many questions that they asked me not to put the episode up because uh, they were embarrassed by some of the things they were answering. But the um, is there anything missing from the pie to get you to that vision? You know, I, I, I don't know if it's finance or whatever, but like what's missing intellectually or or what have you to meet that vision? Uh, a, a little bit more scale. Um, you know, there's a few areas that we could, you know, we're, we're probably a little over 50 people right now in our company. Um, I could see it topping off in terms of the um, kind of discovery arm of the company at around 100. Um, much more than that, I think the teams get a little unwieldy. Um, mm-hmm. So there's, you know, kind of a lot of optimization, a little bit of, you know, growth that, that we could undergo to kind of fill things out. Um, in terms of, you know, building a a vertically integrated company that can go from idea through late stage clinic. Um, You know, just in the last few weeks, we announced the launch of our uh, clinical trial services division. Um, So we're now able to do full service, uh, you know, clinical trial offerings. Um, We don't have um, GMP manufacturing and we don't have uh, GLP toxicology capabilities. So those are really the, the two areas that we don't have um, internally, though we do have aspirations to um, to put on both of those at some point in the future. Would you build them in Syracuse, or would you go distribute it to like a place like Puerto Rico to build those elements? Um, we're strongly of the belief that we want to keep everything stateside. Um, that certainly wouldn't preclude us from like outsourcing certain things to, you know, offshore vendors. And there's certainly no shortage of good vendors in other countries. Um, I'm not saying it has to be stateside, but like, you know, we're in Syracuse. It's a very nice, affordable area. Um, we're really close to Boston, where we have you know a large client base, um, but we don't have you know the Boston-related expenses about you know out here. Like I can go buy fifty acres for like a hundred thousand dollars if I want to. It's you know not an expensive place to live at all, and that allows us to you know really keep our our expenses down and operate you know super efficiently so um and and you see this in general like most of your you know glp um tox labs and and manufacturing plants you know they'll pull them out in the middle of nowhere and in the midwest and stuff just because land's really you know inexpensive um and you know i i I think syracuse is kind of the east coast version of the same Mm -hmm. yeah the uh i was listening to an investor who's describing his like what he looks for when he does something and it's basically like he takes he finds like the main street of a town i don't i don't remember the guy's name i wish i could, I could cite him but and then he just goes out to where the property values dip by a third you know like basically what you're saying to like boston to where you're at and then he just buys up the like the, a huge section and then he waits 20 years and then he makes like you know a ton of money and it sounds like uh if you can get ahead of those trends because a lot of once you start building there other people are going to realize the opportunity and then it kind of like sways things a bit because that's what's happening in austin um uh, where the property values are growing so extremely that the like local people can't really afford them. Um, ideally, you know, it doesn't really happen with Syracuse. Like, it, I, and you'd have to like have a, a massive influx of people going there to have a similar problem. Um, so it sounds like a, like a great place to build. Essentially, is what I'm saying. The the when it comes to um, he mentioned earlier that a, a group got 300 million to develop one like small aspect of phase separation. Um, do you? Will you need to do similar scale of financing to get to that level where you can build this? Um, and then, yeah, do you need like that level of financing? I, I, I don't think so. Um, yeah. You know, the the we already have like, like it, it's entirely a scale thing. So like the same, you know, mo- you know, the same million dollar instruments that they have in their company. I also have they just have 10 of them. I have one. Um, so, you know, there but that that we have everything that we need to onboard all of the assays to show that we can do this to run, you know, I'm not going to run, you know, a hundred 
programs at, at a go, but you know, we could certainly run multiple programs with the existing infrastructure that we have without needing huge cash infusions. Um, you know, frankly, when when I haven't for the life of me figured out what people spend all this money on. Like I get I get if you raise a bunch of money and you're going into clinical trials and you know your IND and first in man studies and whatnot are really expensive, or if you're doing some obscure gene therapy that's you know crazy expensive to manufacture, like I get that. But I don't understand, frankly, how a lot of the these preclinical shops are, you know, raising high tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars and they need that and they don't even have like clinical products yet. It, it even even for the companies that require large startup cash to get equipment and stuff i mean that's a lot of money and they're not you know they're not going out and buying like 50 electron microscopes or something so i'm and i'm not quite sure where those funds are you know how they're being deployed but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me sometimes i wonder if it's a like a like a lifestyle raise where i was at i was in the bay area and uh, I was listening to a, a group of uh, startup people, and uh, if you were talking to them, you, they, you know, outwardly, they'd be like, "Oh, we care about the vision," blah 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 blah, right? And then uh, they were like, "Yeah, after this raise, I'm gonna I'm gonna pay myself like seven seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, and I hope my investors don't notice for a while. <laughs> they just like they want to go to like the Bahamas or something. Uh, I don't I, I don't know like uh, I, I wonder what the comp structures are to to do these types of things because the a similar thing happened with um, what was that evil group? The uh the ones that made like a blood thing, the woman went to Theranos, jail. Theranos, yeah, Theranos. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I don't know where the heck they put all their money in, other than just like buying those people to be on the on the boards and stuff. Um, I, I don't know if someone knew, I, I don't know, but it seems like one of those like lifestyle things where people start you know buying themselves mansions versus like putting their money towards making meaningful changes. Is what you're doing, it sounds like there's a heavy level of accounting with every dollar to go do something meaningful, um, which means you're much more efficient and you have a bigger bang, um, versus like these kind of like. I feel like you can't be that agile with that much money. It's like, like I, mean, I just imagine like a person with like all that money in their pockets. And it's like they're trying to like run a race. Like to some extent, like the money's in the way. Yeah, well, we kind of joke internally that we're the blue collar biotech. I mean, both both my CSO Aaron and I, you know, we we both come from you know very blue collar backgrounds, and you know, even at the company, like you know, I I drink Labatt Blue, uh, you know, and we're out partying and stuff, and uh, you know, we're we're, we're pretty humble in terms of, you know, like our, our lifestyles and live way under our means. Cause you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm interested in making products that actually work and I'll, you know, don't get me wrong. When we make our first drug that we sell for a billion dollars, um, I'm going to, you know, feel very entitled for every penny of that. Cause I know how hard we've worked and how much we sacrificed to get to that point. Um, but until then, you know, really it's an investment in ourselves and you know our belief that we can you know that we can create these technologies and and, and products and the, the other part of it too is you know this is an advantage in being in Syracuse like we don't have the sort of employee turnover that you see in you know San Francisco or Austin or in or in Boston you know we we good program managers on the client side. So our clients, the, the average tenure for a good program manager is only 18 months, and then they get recruited or poached by, you know, someone right next door for even more money and the, the cycle continues. So for, for many of our clients, we're actually their continuity because they turn project managers over so quickly. Um, you have to spend lots of money on all kinds of frivolous, extraneous things just to retain talent if you're in that kind of a competitive environment for the talent that exists. And, you know, we're sitting here in Syracuse and like, you know, we've got SUNY ESF, Upstate Medical, Cornell, uh, Syracuse University, Clarkson. There's all these great unit Rochester. There's all these great universities nearby. And there's like two biotech companies here. So, you know, it, 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 it creates a very good environment where we don't have to worry about spending money on stupid things and we can really focus on getting high quality work done. And it at the same time means that you're not diluting yourself in the vision so that yeah. at the end of the day, um, you know, the, the team can be appreciated and stuff. Cause like I've heard of situations where the owners get diluted to the point where investors just start, uh, uh, I don't know the term for this, but basically slash everyone's pay by a third. Cause they now can do that. And it's like, most of the talent leaves when you do crap like that out of nowhere. Uh, I, there's an organization in Austin that recently, like like a year ago, had that happen, and like they lost like a third of their people because of it. Um, so just like 
the, the continuity of vision as well, it, like you're saying, is like incredibly important. Yeah, um, and continuity yeah. of cap table. If I if I'm not raising you know tons of money, then I'm mm -hmm. not taking a whole lot of dilution, and you retain control. You know, I'm still in control of every company in our portfolio that we directly manage, plus Icor itself, and you know that's after ten years of operating. So you know, that's very helpful in a lot of ways. Yeah. Like, like I was saying in the beginning, I'm surprised like uh, maybe more people after they listen to this are gonna be like, no, maybe we should copy their model. And maybe I, you know, take a, take a, take you out to dinner or something like see how, <laughs> how you do it in detail. But there's a, a book called The Million Man Month, where basically uh, there's this thing where sometimes people say, I want to go faster, so they add more people. They go slower, essentially. Uh, how do you structure your team so that they eat, so they can get to to their uh, to basically actualize to do their best work, but are not bogged down by all the heads in the in the kitchen, all the chefs in the kitchen. So like. How do you structure your teams to get the best from them? Yeah, so so I'll say first of all, uh, we definitely face planted super hard uh, in you know a few years ago going through that exact kind of, you know, the first time we cleared 50 people, um, you know, we had gotten a nice cash infusion, we scaled up super quick. And, um, you know, the, there's very real growing pains. And, you know, everyone like, makes entrepreneurship to be this, you know, rainbows and, you know, butterflies kind of an activity. And it's it's grueling. And that was definitely something we didn't do well at the time that we've gotten much better at now. Um, I, I, I think having uh, very um, structured but collaborative teams where the zones of autonomy for the different people are very clear. Um, what, what we've done is um, among scientists, there's kind of two types of scientists. You have your, your very creative types. Good luck getting them to clean up their workstation. Good luck getting them to follow any sort of organizational structure whatsoever. But they're very creative out of the box. You can deploy them on very nebulous, challenging problems, and they're just going to come up with all kinds of crazy, brilliant things. And then you have your operators. These are your line people that are, you know, think you're Lean Six Sigma, focused on process, quality control throughout. And, and so we kind of rolled with the idea that there's these two personality types and, you know, in, in science. And so we have what we call the lines. So these are where we put all of our operational process people. Um, so we'll have, you know, uh, a manager with, you know, a handful of technicians underneath them, and they'll be responsible for E. coli bioreactors or protein purification or crystallography or some, you know, very specific set of skills and operational tasks. And they're the groups that our clients are interacting with that are, you know, just getting work done and focusing on the quality and throughput of work. And then in physically separate rooms, we kind of have like a sandbox kind of set up where all of the creative types um, operate. Um, I'm very much uh, organized, blah, blah, blah. I get an aneurysm anytime I go in those labs. But um, that's where you get a lot of that, you know, creative stuff. And then once we have something that's worth, you know, really pushing forward we can take the ideas and the experiments from the creative people and then we can use the lines to accelerate and add throughput and scale to whatever really cool discoveries you know the the, the creative types have um so we kind of have a, a hybrid model of creative idea generating new assay development kind of people um and then we have you know straight operators that are much more like a manufacturing workflow uh, workflow or work floor where they're really focused on throughput and, and and quality and that kind of stuff do you uh ever do like uh r d days or innovation days where um i don't know, like once a week or once a quarter something like that where the everyone gets together and can just like creatively explore different ideas uh not really um yes and no so um the we have what's like our intramural group this is the team that reports directly to me that oversees all of our portfolio companies and our new code generation and our uh stealth mode projects um that group meets uh weekly and you know we go through different technical issues that we're working through um different technologies that we're working on um we'll brainstorm things that and, and triage project ideas that we might want to pursue in the next one to two quarters um, and identify like the short list of experiments that can de-risk um, and, you know, otherwise 
kill or move forward those projects. Um, so, so that we do um, kind of like a departmental meeting, if you will, um, on a weekly basis. Um, but the the teams that run the lines don't really, you know, they're focused on optimizing their lines and less so on like new idea generation because they're fundamentally, you know, different skills and different priorities. Yeah, that makes sense. The I've always been, I'm always of the persuasion that you you'd be surprised where ideas can come from. So I don't know if I don't know if you have like the cap table for this or whatever, but like like once a quarter. Uh, there was one time the like everyone like voted for this. They they came in on a Saturday and we spent like like two hours just like innovating different ideas and there's like a process to do it. And even people who are just like uh like an EA and stuff were throwing ideas in there for like server management and stuff. So the it's always crazy when ideas can just kind of percolate and people work together. But um. So this comes to a tradition, and it comes to our first uh, fan question. Long-time listeners will remember this guy's name, or woman's, uh, Town Grizzletown. I don't think this is his legal name. Uh, Three-part question, uh, and I think it's okay. This, these are kind of big, so it's cool if you want to just like pick one or two examples. But uh, what are, I'll just give you the whole thing. What are uh, the startups in the i life sciences portfolio? I think there's like four to six. Uh, what medical interventions are they each developing? And how close are they from human clinical trials? So, I mean, that's a very big question. So it's fine if we just want to like narrow in on like two that you think are pretty interesting. Sure. Um, all right. So startups in our portfolio. Um, so we have a mix of portfolio companies that we run and manage directly. Um, and then we have other portfolio companies that we're financially supporting, but um, I'm not the CEO of those entities, for example. Um, the two companies that we're running internally right now are uh, Lysoclear, which is our oldest flagship program. That's an enzyme therapy for age-related macular degeneration and Stargardt's disease. Um, it's designed to break down uh, lipofuscin that drives those pathologies. Um, so it's a, it's a eye disease company. Um, the other one is Octus Biologics. Um, that's an antibody mimetic platform. Uh, so this is a technology that you can engineer to bind um, protein targets like antibodies can, but it has a lot of uh, favorable characteristics. Uh, for example, it's uh, stable at room temperature, whereas antibodies you have to keep refrigerated mm -hmm. and, and things like that. Um, outside of that, um, for externally supported companies, uh, Mitochem is doing small molecules that um, uh, target mitochondrial function, improve mitoch uh, mitochondrial function. Um, we have uh, Lentobio, which is a company developing small molecules for presbyopia, so uh, to eliminate the need for reading glasses. And um, that molecule works as a breaker of advanced glycation end products. Um, so uh, we think that it will have uh, systemic applications as well. Um, uh, I'll, I'll pause here briefly because um, I think this is uh, an important thing for the audience. Um, i investment strategy and kind of how we're approaching aging. If you target a hallmark of aging, an actual hallmark of aging, which is what our goal is, then that aging hallmark should exist in the eye as well as everywhere else in the body. So it should have some sort of ocular manifestation. And we like developing eye drugs uh, as a first drug for any portfolio company. Can't always, but usually that's where we try to start because there's a lot of things that are uh, advantageous about the eye. It's small. So if I'm making something like a, a gene therapy that could be really expensive to manufacture, I don't need as much product. Um, I avoid things like first pass effect with the liver and PK issues um, for small molecules. You know, you're worried about like hitting, you know, channels in the heart that might cause you to have a heart attack. And uh, all of these sorts of issues don't exist when you're developing a drug in the eye. It's an immune privileged area, so you don't have an uh, immune response issues. Um, so our general model is we like projects, we like compounds, we like platforms, where we can target a very specific eye disease first to build a basic business case for the technology or the molecule. But we want those technologies or platforms or molecules to be able to target systemic aging hallmarks as well. So 
first disease is, is in the eye, then you go for the broader systemic applications. So Lysoclear, Lipofuscin accumulates all over the body, including the eye. We're starting with the eye. Lentobio, advanced glycation end products cause tissue stiffening all across the body. We're starting with presbyopia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so that's kind of how we're approaching building um, the uh, the portfolio. Yeah. And then uh, are any of them, how far or close are they from human uh, clinical trials was the last part? Uh, we're, we're hoping close. Um, so for both Lentobio and for Lysoclear, um, where both of those companies are doing their, um, their, uh, major, uh, efficacy study, their pivotal efficacy studies right now, um, in preclinical models, um, for Lentobio, um, they're already outperforming a, an asset that was bought for $500 million by Novartis back in 2016. Um, so the, the leads that we're working with for Lentobio and also Lysoclear are of you know very, very high quality, and we think they're going to be ready for prime time very shortly. Um, we uh, have uh, uh, pharma deals around some of the assets that we're developing. That's kind of an advantage to running a CRO is that we get to see the pipelines for all these different companies. So if we have something in our portfolio that's a good fit, um, you know, we can structure uh, partnership opportunities and, and, and stuff like that. So we, we have several of those deals. Um, some are in progress and uh, some were, you know, in the process of negotiating because um, I, I'm, we can bring products into the clinic ourselves, but um, it really makes sense if we can partner those off uh, to, you know, let a, let a strategic partner, you know, take them into the clinic and develop those for us. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. The, for, uh, just a quick, uh, and then I, actually i'll go to the fan question because they they ask you a specific question about lysoclear so i feel like this is a good trend uh, uh, <laughs> okay. uh continue on so this is barrel master which once again like people will, will know this person um you're using a lipo nano i don't just for the record i have no phd so like there are some acronyms here i'm hoping you know what they are you're using a lipid nano okay i know what they are now you're using a lipid nano particle to deliver your lysoclear enzyme how are you managing the toxicity that can be associated with higher doses of ketonic nl lnps or are you using some other LNP that avoids these problems? Uh, so short answer is I can't talk about the LNP <laughs> okay. because it's the proprietary technology mm -hmm. of our uh, pharmaceutical partner. Um, what I can say is um, those issues are substantively avoided um, in part because um, we're not intending to have a uh, therapy that is being administered on a frequent basis. Um, so, um, if you consider that for macular degeneration, the, and, and Stargardt's disease, um, the lipofuscin that accumulates in the RPE cells and drives the disease takes almost a lifetime to accumulate to pathological levels. You know, in the case of macular degeneration, most patients are 50, 60, 70 years old, um, before they start to become, uh, symptomatic. So if we have an enzyme that we can deliver as an mRNA with say a lipid nanoparticle and we can deliver that once or twice, uh, that very well may be sufficient to eliminate 10, 20 years worth of junk accumulation. And that means that we have uh, a lot of room to play with in terms of frequency of delivery as a function of delivery dose. Um, so it's not like, um, you know, a lot of a lot of the lipid nanoparticles, like if you're doing systemic delivery, you do have those, you know, those sorts of problems. Um, even with ocular applications, you can have those, uh, th those problems as well. Um, but because we can get away with, you know, relatively low dosing, we're not, we're not saturating a receptor or something where we need really high doses, we're making an enzyme. So as soon as it's expressed, it's churning over the stuff, it's degrading, and the enzymes not just going away right away, it's getting a lot of work done before it naturally Really turns over. Um, so we, we think this is going to build out a very favorable um, 
you know, uh, therapeutic index for the uh, for for the lead. Um, I'll also mention, um, although our primary focus right now is in uh, lipid nanoparticles as a delivery system because of our collaboration, um, it's not the only delivery mechanism that we're pursuing. At the end of the day, uh, we can deliver protein, we can deliver mRNA for the protein, and there's a lot of different uh, delivery vehicles uh, through which that can be achieved. So um, for my public talks and stuff, I'm mostly focusing on the LNPs because that's kind of our front runner that is furthest along at the moment. Um, but, you know, we're looking at AAVs, we're looking at a bunch of different types of LNPs as well as a few other delivery modalities. So, um, you know, the jury's still out on that. Mm -hmm. What, um, how does the Lysoclear intervention look like it's going to stack up when it compared to the other options? There's like, there's stem cells, there's something called anti-VEGF injections, there's other therapies like if there was like, I don't know, like one of those little charts that you have in business school, I don't know. Uh, do we know enough to know how it's gonna like how it looks like it's gonna it's stacking up? Yeah, yeah. So, so we're we're expecting to be way upstream of everything else. Um, so, uh, the uh, there is now one approved drug. It doesn't work terribly well uh, for the early macular degeneration. Um, so, uh, let, let me take a step back. Um, macular degeneration is a progressive disease. It starts with the accumulation of lipofuscin in RPE cells in the back of the eye. And as the disease progresses, this junk chokes out and kills the RPE cells, and that causes collapse of your photoreceptors and all of kind of the downstream pathology. Um, collectively, that's the early to moderate stage AMD called dry AMD or atrophic macular degeneration. Um, in the late stage, you can have, because it's uh, inflammatory mess in the back of the eye, you can have new blood vessel formation. It's all hypoxic and stuff, so you get new blood vessel formation um, that's uh, predominantly controlled by VEGF pathway. And so um, the current standard of care, um, the one drug that was just approved this year for dry macular degeneration um, reduces your rate of progression, but it doesn't necessarily reverse or prevent the disease. It's, it just influences the rate. Um, the primary market for macular degeneration is antibodies that target this VEGF pathway. Um, they work moderately well, um, and they're a multi-billion dollar market, but that's only 10% of patients that have macular degeneration. So the other 90% that have the earlier stages, um, as of this year, there's only one other thing they can take, and it doesn't work terribly well. And before this year, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. um, what we're looking to do with Lysoclear is at the very early stages, you know, your, your ophthalmologist can look in the back of the eye and see this junk accumulating. You can see it macroscopically, um, is to administer our drug and eliminate that intracellular junk before it starts killing the cells and starts kicking off all this downstream pathology. And, you know, we can see that you know, years before uh, it'll become pathological, we can see it accumulating. And so there's a nice window of, we know this is there, we know the patient has a risk of progressing, um, let's treat them before the disease actually progresses. Kind of like with atherosclerotic plaque, we can see and we know plaques are forming long before you have rupture of a vessel or stenosis, right? You can monitor that. Same thing in the eye. Um, so we're anticipating being way upstream of any of these other um, therapeutics. Yeah, it doesn't sound like you need to do, like, you know, there's always that problem in uh, business. Sometimes you have to educate the population, but it's a normal flow to get your eyes checked. I think once a year. At least, you know, for people who are visually impaired like me, I, I get my <laughs> eyes checked. So they would see it and be like, hey, you want to uh, check out Lysoclear? And you get a an MRI injection or something like that, and then it takes care of it. Uh, using your model that you described earlier, of you take this as like a proof of concept, then you apply it to other things. What are the other um, diseases that you can potentially target with this structure um, outside of macro generation? Like what is, what is like the other things that can do to the body? Uh, there are other areas of the body that have lipofuscin accumulation as kind of a hallmark. Um, in atherosclerotic plaque formation, for example, um, there's a, uh, a type of cholesterol called 7-ketocholesterol that accumulates and seems to be highly resistant to degradation. 
Um, so we could pursue similar strategies, uh, perhaps with the same enzymes, perhaps with different enzymes uh, for different systemic applications. Um, right now, we're mostly focused on just getting this asset over the uh, over the finish line and partnered, so to speak. Um, but I think the um, you know, the, the strategy of being able to upgrade our lysosomes to degrade stuff that normally our body can't turn over um, has a lot of, you know, potential, not just in aging diseases with lipofuscin accumulation, but in other things as well. Um, but I, I don't have a, a particular plan at the moment mm -hmm. for, you know, what specific diseases or, you know, targets we would go after because we're, we're mostly just focused on the eye asset. Yeah. So it sounds like the uh, maybe like once every 20 years you'd get you take uh the lysosome in a direct uh treatment and it basically knock it down to the point where it's no longer prevalent doesn't sound like a cure but it does run into my question i always wonder if, if you had functional if you had uh functional enough re rejuvenation is it the same as a cure where if you just are always kind of this is like a future i always wonder about like is that are we going to get to the point where we don't cure things we just are so good at treating them in terms of like rejuvenating you know like moving the eyes back or like clearing things out or taking senescent cells out what have you where it basically rewinds the clock and then we just keep going forward and then we get to that point again, you just rewind, you know, it's always like rolling, rolling back the clock and sleeping in essentially. Do you think that, uh, do you think that, do, what do you think of the future where we basically just have functional rejuvenation? Well, well I think that's, I think that's what you have to do um, mm. to try to interfere. I mean, you've had Aubrey DeGray on your show and you know, th this is the whole premise of his damage repair approach, right? Like, manipulating biology and metabolism is really, really difficult. Whereas if you have damage or bad things accumulating that you can fix periodically, um, then you can sustain something for, you know, far longer than its intended useful life. He likes using vintage cars as an example of that, right? And I don't necessarily need to understand the, you know, the, the, the redox mechanism of how rust accumulates on a fender to, you know, repaint it or replace a rusted fender, right? So, so it allows a sidestepping of a lot of uh, ignorance. So I, I do think that's how these um, products are going to need to um, function. Um, I, I do want to draw a distinction, though, with like uh, eliminating um, uh, cure versus, you know, versus the treatments and stuff. Um, I, I do think something like like so clear if, uh, if that works as intended, um, I do think that would be curative because uh, you would never be allowing the pathology to occur. So even though you would have to, uh, you know, receive it maybe once every 10 years, once every 20 years, whatever the frequency is, um, that would eliminate the pathology from ever occurring. That's very different than existing therapies where VEGF pathway, you're kind of inhibiting it to prove, you know, to, to reduce the rate at which it progresses. Um, you know, that that's not actually doing anything to reverse or halt the disease state. It's slowing it, but it's not reversing or halting it. Um, and, and, and I think that distinction with, you know, with these sorts of drug products is, is, is important and why they hold so much potential. Yeah. Are you uh, at all familiar with Michael Levin's work with bioelectricity and um, that whole side of it? I suspect you are based on your, your facial response, but yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, I, I was late to the game. I just uh, I just became aware of this work um, th this year and probably within the last six months or so. But um, so I haven't had a, a whole lot of time to study uh, in uh, any proper detail, but I saw a few of his talks and uh, minimally, I would say, look super cool um i don't have uh any strong technical opinions on what he's doing beyond that just because i'm not well read in enough okay but then i will i will uh not ask you those questions about growing eyes and uh, regenerating limbs which he was on the show so if you if you want to uh, listen to uh, him talk about it the he, he can it's, it's such a wild thing if it's true and it seems like his, his studies are, are pretty uh impressive to you know but okay so this was i think the only criticism i found on of all the people uh from the people who wrote in and this this is the one i was thinking about in terms of like i don't know the acronyms uh and if i if if you're like well i don't know i'm gonna cut this but uh so jaro scientist said uh good luck kelsey which you know nice start unfortunately from a clinical development perspective i think ga will be a tough indication to pursue op regen h e s c derived rpe cells have already shown in vivo human evidence of stopping ga lesions growth in addition to GA reversal, and Roche is leading these PH2A trials. 
this is a high bar to clear to for damage repair enthusiasts. I have mild dyslexia, so I think I did a good job there. <laughs> uh, you did a great, you did a great <laughs> job, and uh, no, no, I, I, I appreciate your uh, uh, the audience's inquiry. Um, so, so the key is geographic atrophy. So um, I had mentioned as the RPE cells start to die and the photoreceptors that rely upon them start to collapse. Um, you can actually see that when you look into the back of the eye, you see like kind of like this, uh, this growing uh, area where you can actually see through the back of the eye to the blood vessels underneath. Um, and, and that's clinically called uh, geographic atrophy. Um, there are other drugs, including, I, I think this person had mentioned, um, uh, IPSC or ESC derived, uh, RPE cells. Um, so the cells that are being damaged and dying in this process, um, you can actually create graphs and inject either individual cells or graphs, um, to restore function. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I I I think it'll boil down to how well our products work and the economics of it. Um, if you're doing, for, first of all, any stem cell therapy is going to be very expensive. Uh, we, we do a lot of work in cell therapy, especially on the client side. Uh, manufacturability is a real technical problem. Um, although the eye is immune uh, privileged, um, there are certainly issues about um, uh, causing, you know, immune reactions and stuff if you have long-term permanent grafts. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure if this is still the case, but I know in the early days of these sorts of technologies, you know, patients need to be on immunosuppression and stuff like that, though um, don't hang me on that. My information on that front might be outdated at this point. Um, so, so, so doing a, you know, a, a subretinal surgery where you're trying to administer a very expensive cell and have it integrate with the local environment, um, possible works. Um, that's, uh, a lot more invasive, a lot more technically difficult than a simple intravitreal injection. Um, people get very queasy with anything eye related, especially if you're talking about needles, but eye drop numbs the eye. You look to the side, poke outpatient procedure, you're done in, you know, a minute. Um, that That's a completely different burden than doing a, a cell-based therapy that requires a surgery. And if there's, you know, immune, um, uh, if there's, you know, any sort of uh, uh, immune inhibitors that you need to be on for that, um, you know, that adds complexity. And then what we're talking about is something that would hopefully be, you know, every couple of years or maybe every decade, um, not require any sort of chronic immunosuppression and would probably be a lot cheaper and a quicker outpatient procedure. So um, I think the economics, if, uh, you know, if our program works as we're hoping it will, um, you know, I, I think the economics will win it out there pretty easily. But um, at the end of the day, the best treatment is what's going to, you know, win in the market. And that's why, you know, I'm certainly not against any cell therapy approaches. In fact, I'm, you know, a huge fan of cell therapies in general. Um, so I, I don't have any, you know, qualms about both options being pursued in parallel and see what wins out. I'm biased. I think we're going to win out, but um, we'll see. And if all we did is contribute a little bit more knowledge to, you know, different approaches for developing drugs, so be it. Yes. Uh, Joe Scientist, uh, of the two avenues, have, as have been described to me, I would also assume that yours is probably the better mo uh, mousetrap here. The, but at the same time, I look forward to seeing your uh, discussion in the comment section. The, I know people at this point are going are gonna to be, why haven't you asked about the Aubrey Gray mice study? He's referenced it four or five times. So if you, like, what's, especially when you said, like, this is something that's very exciting to you. Uh, so before we get into some personal questions, uh, how is that study going? Um, what was it like for Aubrey Gray to pick you guys? Um, then at the same time, like, I don't know. You guys are like longevity related. It kind of feels like in theme. Like, who else would you go with? But uh, I'm sure there's other people who could have done that job. So, what? what how is that process going? Yeah, no, the the, the study's insane um, in, in the good way. Um, but so, so for those that aren't aware, um, uh, Aubrey de Grey had uh, started his new foundation, um, LAV Foundation. And basically what he wants to do is run iterative lifespan studies in mice. So the idea is to take individual um, uh, treatments that are already shown to extend the lifespan of mice, 
and try them in different combinations. Um, there's there's a few reasons that this is important. Um, one, he thinks that this is, you know, if he was able to demonstrate, you know, robust mouse rejuvenation, that would open the floodgates of, you know, government and other funding into the space that would really help accelerate the translation of these technologies to people. Um, the reason I'm very interested in this as a as a program is, um, you know, everyone that studies the space is familiar with the hallmarks of aging. And there's an assumption that if you target each of these hallmarks of aging individually, um, that they will uh you know, be synergistic. If you target multiple hallmarks of aging at the same time, you're going to have a greater positive effect than the sum of the individual parts. That has never actually, to my knowledge, been proven experimentally. So um, in this case, what he's doing is he's taking four different interventions. Um, he's got a hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, beta-galactosidase conjugated to nevidoclax as a senolytic, um, he's got rapamycin and a uh, telomerase virus, and each of these is being done in isolation. Uh, there's a negative control group, and then there's every possible combination, including um, uh, arms that are treated with all four interventions. And um, the idea is the cohort sizes are 100 each, 50 male, 50 female, so very large group sizes. Um, we're doing all manner of behavioral and diagnostic assays uh, on these animals throughout the study, um, and we're seeing how things go. Um, so far, uh, the results are really encouraging. The um, you know the animals that uh, receive no treatment are dying the quickest, and they're following the you know predicted um, trajectories that we would expect. Um, the single or multi you know treated groups are living longer, and the all combination one seems to be holding out the best. So we're um, you know we're we're pretty excited with these results so far, and it's very early in the study still. Um, you know we've just started to see the 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 deaths and the Kaplan Meier curve uh, occur, but um, you know so far everything seems to be going uh, really smoothly with it. And of course we're banking so many tissue, you know, all manner of tissues from all of these animals. So, um, you know, I'm sure there'll be years and years of downstream molecular work and stuff that could be, that could be done, uh, following this. Uh, is there anything that's been surprising about the process? Anything that, um, has come from it that you guys weren't really expecting? Um, I wouldn't say anything that's, uh, surprising. Um, we we were uh, I'll say relieved. Um, one of the challenges, you know, th these are old geriatric mice, um, so they don't handle stress and stuff in the same way. I mean, we've been doing lifespan studies for a decade, so we're very you know very comfortable handling them. But they don't you know undergo anesthesia as well. They don't undergo handling and stuff nearly as well as younger mice, just because they're you know they're old and that's what happens. Um, and so one of the big concerns we had uh, with the study is with combining all of these treatments into a single mouse. Um, for the hematopoietic stem cell transplant, for example, um, you, you have to pre-treat the animal so that when it receives the cells, they're able to engraft. Normally, this is done with radiation, but you don't want to irradiate a mouse if you're trying to make it live longer. That kind of defeats the purpose. Um, so for the stem cells, for example, um, we had to treat them for multiple weeks with a recombinant protein called granulocyte colony stimulating factor. And then we uh, treated them with another mobilization agent right before they received the cells, uh, AMD3100. Um, so they had all of these injections. Then they got the actual treatment. And we've got rapamycin in the diet. We've got the senolytics where they're getting dosed daily for periods of time. Um, and then, you know, they're having to go under, you know, anesthesia, for example. I, I think we had done anesthesia for the, uh, with, for the virus, um, as well. Um, but point being, this is a lot of handling and a lot of poking in these old mice. Um, so we were concerned that actually the all treatment group wouldn't do that well, not because the treatments didn't work, but just the extra stress of all that handling. Um, and in the control groups, we had done non-handled animals and animals that had been handled and gotten all the injections, just obviously not with a therapeutic. Um, and we haven't seen any uh, any differences in you know how long they're they're living. So that that was a very favorable finding that we were worried about. The I think Gingo Bioworks has like this uh, 
database biobanky thing that it's very like loosely defined but there's like a big like machine learning database component to what they offer is that uh something you guys are because you mentioned a minute ago that you, you are you know tissue sampling and all this like building so do you see yourself um like one of the branches eventually being like this big like uh data lake uh for developing uh therapies or whatever uh, very possibly, and you know that that'd be a question for Aubrey because you know it's his study, his foundation, yeah. and his samples at the end of the day. But um, I know he's actively seeking collaborators, and you know we're capturing these tissues. You know we've got fixed tissues, we've got flash frozen tissues, we've got you know uh, every possible way that you can collect and bank these things. Um, you know we have been so that there's a nice repository of tissues that are available to other investigators. Um, so you know if there's anyone listening that has a lab and might be interested in getting their hands on some of these tissues specimens um you know reach out to aubrey i'm sure he'd be you know very enthusiastic to hear from you sweet all right so i know we're coming up on time so i just have some rapid fire questions and you can even pick pass if you want if you don't like any <laughs> of the if you don't like them so first uh first one is i'm always surprised by how uh legal documentation like what you have people sign so not nda or employment contracts what is a surprising legal document that you use most often when it comes to your work uh that someone on the outside would would not realize is like actual like thing because uh, yeah, I'm just always surprised by what people are required to have people sign. Um, I'd say one of the most frequent weird ones that I hadn't thought of was uh, allergy forms for going through the uh, our mm -hmm. vivarium. So yeah, you know, we have visitors obviously and and clients that audit our uh, our sites, you know, fairly regularly and. Um, you know, a lot of people actually have allergies to mice and rats, and there's a whole process with, you know, making sure that they're medically able to go through the facility that I hadn't appreciated until, you know, we owned one. That's interesting. Yeah, I wouldn't have guessed that either. The, uh, when were you the happiest in your life? Um, that's a, that's a tough question. Wow. I suppose it depends on how you define happiness. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. if you, you know, I, I, I'd say, you know, right before this whole adventure, when I got like my first check to start i and, you know, it was like, you know, 120 grand and I'm like shaking as I'm holding this check and, you know, freaking out about the whole thing. It's like, all right, we're going to go do this. And, you know, but that, that was one of those uh, blissfully ignorant happinesses that, you know, comes from, you know, the hope of what's to come rather than the satisfaction of something that you've accomplished. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's a tough one. Uh, I'm going to have to take a pass on that. I don't know. That's uh that's a real tough one. Good question. I think, yeah. I think, I think <laughs> you, you kind of answered it too. Uh, what, what, uh, speaking of, uh, Icortha, what has been a big sacrifice in being a founder over, you know, I mean, you could have been a medical doctor. You could have done anything else. What, what is the sacrifice that people don't realize that you've had to, to make, to do what you're doing today? Oh, I mean, you know, I mean, the stress, especially as you're, you know, trying to to build out a company i mean you know we're we're nice and stable now fortunately but you know in our 10-year history i had four times that i was within two weeks of you know being insolvent uh you know whether it's waiting for investor checks to come in or unforeseen issues that arose and um you know for for me i i, I take very personally the relationship that we have with you know with our employees and i understand that like you know, we're, we're the employer. So, you know, I, I want everyone to, you know, make a bunch of money and be successful and be able to focus on, you know, doing good work and not have to worry about whether they're going to have a job. And I know how, you know, disruptive, you know, firing people and things like that can be not just on individuals, but their families and their entire life situation. So, um, you know, having to stare down the 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 barrel of, uh, you know, challenging financial situations throughout the company's history, um, you know, was was probably the the most difficult thing that I've had to deal with. And, you know, I had many circumstances where, you know, I'm just like sitting up awake all night trying to figure out, you know, how we're going to, you know, manage cash flow and where we can get money from to, you know, again, those are earlier days of the company, but, um, you know, the, the, you know, the risks back then were, you know, a lot higher and, you know, at, over time, not only is the company stabilized with like revenues and stuff, but, you know, you make more friends. So if you ever did run into those issues, there's people that you can call to help. But in the early days, you know, you're just building those relationships in the network. You're really on your own. And, you know, if you can't make payroll, then the whole thing just 
collapses and you're done. And, you know, I, I think that the, the stress of having to deal with that is, uh, you know, like I said, a lot of people romanticize the idea of being an entrepreneur, but I think the people that, you know, have actually done it, um, they have to make some very difficult decisions or deal with, you know, very difficult circumstances. And I, I feel like founders and CEOs don't talk about those challenges, you know, nearly enough, but anyone that says that, you know, they actually built something and didn't have those challenges is, is very much misrepresenting. Um, you know, the, those challenges are real. They're very, very difficult. And, you know, they, they take a lot out of the founders for sure. Mm-hmm. The, so Brian Johnson has the, the blueprint, blueprint protocol, dyslexia. The, are you, what do you think of uh, the protocol? And are you doing something, anything like that to optimize for your own health? Uh, good question. So um, the short answer is uh, I, I do have, uh, you know, Brian Johnson's little supplement list here. Um, I do uh, personally take that uh, most days uh, on the supplement side. Um, I'm trying to, uh, I'm a competitive basketball player, so um, I'm optimizing a little bit more for um, basketball performance than general health, I would say. Um, so I, I do kind of, uh, I do intermittent fasting. I do the supplement regimen that he subscribes to. Um, and um, I do a very different general diet and um, a fitness routine than what he does. Um, I don't have a strong yes, this is definitely a thing that's working or valuable or no, this is stupid. And I know Brian Johnson in particular, uh, there is a very polarizing figure and a lot of haters and a lot of people that worship him. Um, I haven't looked a whole lot personally into the supplement line of things. So um, I'm assuming that he's done a lot more research on the merits of the different supplements and stuff to be in a better dis- you know, position to make a decision than me. Um, and I'll change my personal regimen as I have time and data that suggests doing something different. Mm-hmm. And then uh, what is the best way for people to stay up to date with everything you got? You guys should have like a master newsletter or something, but how, do, how can people stay up to date? I don't know. I mean, there, there's a lot of, uh, you know, longevity technology, lifespan.io, you know, individuals like you that do these sorts of podcasts, you know, there's a lot of really good information that um, exists out there. Um, I have the benefit of having, you know, an entire company that works with me. So um, I have people that are constantly scouring the literature and, you know, presenting kind of the latest stuff to me to stay up to date. Um, You know, certainly a lot of the longevity focused conferences, uh, you know, I'll give a shout out to Aubrey. His uh, Dublin conference is awesome. And for people that can make it out, they just announced the dates for that for next year. Um, that one's a, a really good one. Um, ARDD in Copenhagen um, is another one. I, I think both of those can give you um, a, a lot of exposure in a very short period of time. And if you can't, you know, do the the traveling for those, uh, both venues offer um, e-tickets where you can, you know, watch all the talks. So those are, those are both, um, I'll, I'll say a lot of information for a relatively sh- uh, small time investment. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, well then, uh, for people looking for Kelsey's website, uh, it'll be in the show notes as well, but I mean, I go therapeutics and type in Kelsey and it's like the number one thing that pops up other than our interviews. Uh, but Kelsey, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, uh, answering uh, all of our questions and mine as well. Um, thanks for coming on today. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me.